Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm uh, Suresh Daniela, Bayer D. Clarkson and Distinguished Professor in Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering, and the co-director of CARES at Clarkson University in New York. Uh, my talk today is about uh, aerosol fit in a room, uh, and uh, we used low-cost sensors to ask the question as to you know, what would ventilation do to the fate of particles in a closed space. Before getting into the talk, I uh, thought I'll just provide a quick overview of the problem of ventilation and, uh, and where we are on this important topic. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of discussion right now on the role of ventilation as part of these engineering controls that CDC recommends that we use to control the spread of airborne disease. Um, other agencies, uh, in particular DOE, has also been interested in ventilation. They've been looking at it from an energy efficiency perspective. Uh, they've been calling for tighter buildings so as to minimize the leak of airflow into and out of buildings because that results in energy leak. And these tighter buildings have created an indoor air problem and ASHRAE has tried to address that by setting standards for minimum ventilation. And a lot of these standards are focused on CO2 mitigation, and uh, that's changing a little bit now by looking at particles. My interest here is to understand what the fate of aerosol would be in a room. I'm going to consider this room as a box, so we'll call these box models. Um, so I'll have to consider the injection rate of the particles from a source, could be a person. Um, and we'll also have to consider the injection of flow through the ventilation system and the removal again back through the ventilation system. In addition to this, these particles that are injected could be lost to the walls due to diffusion or to gravitational deposition or could be resuspended back as the person walks around. Considering all of these, we can calculate the number concentration in the room uh, from a governing equation that says that uh, you know, all of this injection of particles in blue here and all of these loss mechanisms in the red, if you Consider all of that, you can now figure out what is the accumulation of particles in this room. Solve for the simple ODE, and you'll get an expression for the change in number concentration over time. You'll see that it depends on the initial concentration, which is just modulated by this exponential term, um, where it's over, over time, it'll, it'll be diluting this initial concentration. And if you wait long enough, the first term goes to zero, and you'll end up with a steady state term in infinity. To understand these, the importance of these, uh, or the physical meaning of these constants, alpha and, uh, and infinity, uh, let's, uh, uh, so the expressions are given here, but let's look at, the, uh, at a simpler case. To understand model predictions, let's consider the simple scenario. Consider a person who's talking and breathing, and so they're putting out particles in the size range of 500 nanometers to about five micron. These particles are not small enough to deposit due to diffusion or big enough to settle down due to gravity. If you are coughing and sneezing, some of these uh, effects become important. So in the simple scenario, you will end up with uh, just the, the important things to consider here would be the source rate, the rate at which the particles are emitted by this person, and the flow and the particles coming in and out with the ventilation system. The expression for particle concentration change over time would remain the same, but these constants now have simpler expressions, easier to digest and understand. Uh, alpha is the ratio of the flow rate that's coming in by divided by the volume, and that we will call that as the air changes per hour. If you're bringing in just enough volume of uh, or the flow rate to be equal to the volume of the room in one hour. Uh, the flow rate you bring in one hour is equal to the volume of the room, your air changes per hour would be one. You bring in more flow, you've got higher air changes. The uh, concentration uh, at, at a large time, the first term will drop out, you will reach a steady state concentration in infinity. That steady state concentration depends on how much you're putting out per second uh, and the volume of the room and the air changes coming in. Um, to understand you know, how these terms depend on air changes, which looks like an important parameter, both of them, if, if, if you consider the fate of the particles of concentration changes in this room over, let's say, one hour, uh, and, and 
look at track the concentration change. If the ad changes are zero, the concentrations are just going to be climbing up linearly. If the ad changes are higher, say about four, the concentrations level off. After some time, this uh, this uh, ad changes is, is about four. After some time, this term goes to zero. You'll end up with this uh, concentration leveling off. And where it levels off uh, is it depends on the ad changes. Again, if the ad change is high, it's going to level off at a low value. If an ad change of 20, which is consistent with what you might see in a, a hospital room and an operating room in a hospital, that you know levels off at a pretty low value. It also levels off uh, very quickly. It levels off very quickly. And then when you take the source off, uh, with the fast, with the high ad changes, again, it drops off very quickly. If you have a lower ad change, it takes a while for it to drop off. We use some of this information in, for our classes, uh, restart of our classes in fall, uh, to ensure that uh, a person entering one room uh, does not pick up contamination from the, uh, from somebody who has left that same room some time back. And uh, you know, so we've got several models uh, that, are, that that account for all of these complexities. They're available for anybody to use. Uh, Nest has some pretty good ones for Tima and Contam in particular. Uh, ones uh, I would recommend. Uh, the critical assumption I want to remind everybody is that all of these models assume a well mixed room. So everywhere in the room, we assume that these are there are identical concentrations and trends. We ignore the exact location of the vents and the um, and where the source is. And so, you know, based on these assumptions, uh, we would, you know, we we cannot predict social distancing. As a matter of fact, we'll say everywhere if the concentrations are identical, we would say social distancing is not possible within a room for these particles, 500 nanometers to 5 micron. These airborne. Uh, particles in this limited size range. So we wanted to study and see if, uh, if uh, you know, if, if the reality is uh, any different from that. And for that, uh, we wanted to map aerosol concentrations uh, in classrooms around campus with, you know, different volumes, different ad exchange rates. And, uh, and we were mapping these concentrations from a generation source. We were generating it and a steady rate using a nebulizer, nebulizing ammonium sulfate in that size range of interest, 500 nanometers, 5 micron. We moved the injection source from being close to the, uh, maybe the front of the room to middle and back and so on. So we moved them around a bit. And we measured the concentrations using sensors from a local startup, Telosair, that I'm involved in. Uh, it measures a variety of different uh, uh, properties including uh, aerosol concentrations using plant towers PMS 5003 unit. Uh, the, uh, the the key thing, uh, reason to select these sensors was that you know these are operating on a LoRa mesh network so setting up these sensors is very straightforward, uh, no setup required and then the data all goes to cloud and we can access that from uh, using an API. We evaluated the sensors by co-locating them with uh, and research grade instrument, TSI's APS instrument. And then we compared how the concentrations change with time for these injected particles. What we found was that the APS concentrations compared to these, uh, these low cost sensors, these duets, uh, you know, they lined up pretty good. The R squared value in, from this comparison was about 0.9. Uh, and when, when we just compared the low cost sensors with each other, we found that the R squared value was about 0.95. So they're very precise. Uh, and that's good for our uh, classroom studies. And we studied, uh, you know, classrooms uh, ranging in sizes and shapes. Uh, this is one of the bigger classroom studies. This is about uh, 10 meters uh, tall in the back um, and uh, accommodates about 100 students to a smaller classroom accommodating about 30 students with, with uh, a lower uh, ceiling. And we put anywhere from 20 to 30 sensors in these rooms. Uh, the first... Uh, you know, the uh, results that we analyzed were to see what would happen when we inject particles, look for the rise, and then uh, what did the decay look like? So we inject, started injecting particles around here, we let the concentrations go up, and then we turned it off and watched it go down. Uh, we know what the general trend of the equation should be from those box models. We fit that and we extract these, uh, the, the property of interest here, which is our uh, ad exchange rate alpha. 
And then we we wanted to explore and examine if the if the ad exchange rate as calculated from the up climb was the same as that it would be from the down climb, which is what models predict. And what we noticed was that yes, there is there is a bit of a linear relationship when the ad exchange rate was higher in one, it was higher in the other one. Uh, but there's also a small bias. It seemed like the particles would rise up faster than it would decrease. Um, and that has to do with airflow patterns uh, that I will leave out of this talk because of lack of, because of uh, insufficient. Um, so yeah, so the uh, air exchange is similar for climb and decay, let's say. And then when we look at this room, uh, what we uh, find is that the sensors distributed in this room don't uh, all have the same profile. This, they all have different profiles. So we then fit individual curves to it and then compare the air exchange rate uh, just during the up climb, let's say, or down climb, one of them. Uh, again, there's different sensors. And what we found was that uh, from, for sensors as a function of distance from the source, there's a, there's a lot of variability in what the air changes would be. But on an average, we found that the air exchange rate uh, was largely unchanged from the front of the room to the back of the room, um, at least for this one classroom that I'm, I'm plotting here. And this suggests that uh, that you know the general behavior of a well mixed room uh, is somewhat applicable. Uh, you know, it's, uh, particles that are climbing up decay at the same rate uh, throughout the room, but but not all. But it's not entirely well mixed. We can see very clearly here the concentrations in one sense are very different from one uh, somewhere else. So when we explore that a little more closely, uh, what we see is that the if I, if we plot the relative concentration. Uh, where one represents the concentration at the source to the distance from the source. As we go farther away, we see that the concentrations largely decay. And this, this decay here is independent of air exchange rate. An air exchange rate of five, we see some decay. Air exchange rate of nine, we also see some decay. What you see is that when you have a low air exchange rate, we see that the decay is actually not very strong. And as a matter of fact, even, you can, even if you are about 10 meters away, still the concentrations are still only about 70 or 80 percent of what they would be close to the source. This would suggest that at this low air exchange rates, the room is, behaves like a well mixed room. So it is actually a, the well mixed assumption is probably valid when the air exchange rates are, are low. But under a high air exchange rate, uh, we do see a decay. If you're about 10 meters away, you're breathing about 20 percent of the concentration of uh, rather than being rather than what you might close to the emitter. I, I want to make a quick note about two meters of age of six feet um, in, you know, for the small particles, 500 nanometers to five micron, uh, social distancing doesn't really work uh, with you know, at least these sorts of air exchange rates. Um, but if you're standing about five uh, meters away, you, your concentration that you're breathing will be about half of what it would be close by. So we do need, so I want to conclude by saying that, you know, we need this uh, to revisit this, uh, this, expression for what, what the number concentration changes in the room would be, we have to consider the spatial effect to be completely accurate. Uh, so I want to conclude by saying that, you know, box models are helpful, are very helpful. They provide an average picture of what's happening for aerosol fate. Um, and we've used that quite a bit to determine how long we should wait before we enter a room uh, if, uh, when we set up our class schedule uh, in fall. Um, the box models, uh, however, would suggest that social distancing of particles, small particles, let's say 10 micron, is not possible. And, uh, uh, you know, but what we're finding from experiments is that the box models are actually reasonable when the air exchange rates are low, less than about six. A more realistic model would be one where we would consider the flow in the, in the uh, room to be similar to flow through a turbulent tube. You know, in a turbulent tube, as the particles are traveling through the tube, they're getting lost and the concentration is going down. In a room, these, are, these particles, as they're going down this room, they're continuously getting diluted by fresh air that's being injected by all these vents uh, throughout the room, and they get diluted. And when the air exchange rates are about, you know, nine or so, greater than about six, we believe that, uh, that the box models start failing. And, uh, and, even, and, and I want to note that even when you have a very high air exchange rate of about 10, uh, you, and you, st you stand about five meters away to get the concentrations to be about half of what. I want to conclude with some final observations. The current ventilation standards 
are based on the amount of fresh air that needs to be delivered on a per person basis. So the assumption here is that everyone is an emitter, which is indeed true when we're talking about CO2. Uh, the standards call for you know, more fresh air when more people are present. And so you know, you're gonna have, when the occupancy is high, is when you're gonna have a high air changes per hour. So if you consider a scenario where there's only one emitter, you know, which is not unusual when you're talking about bioaerosol, then by the current indoor air standards, it actually is paradoxically better to be in a more crowded room. Because in a crowded room, you got you have a higher air changes per hour, and so you've got greater dilution. Um, and you know, so that's something that I think needs to be reconsidered uh, in, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, and the typical standards that we're calling for, you know, 10 liters per second per person would result in a uh, lecture hall having an uh, air exchange rate of about five which we said would be inadequate when you consider particles in the size range of 500 nanometers to five micron, which could carry pathogens such as SARS-CoV-2. So we really do need to uh, relook at the standards from the pandemic perspective. Uh, that's all I have for today. I appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.